Okay. Well, in the in the interest of uh, being respectful for everyone who who did arrive here on time, and we have many of our uh, our registrants have already signed in. We're going to keep going, uh, especially here. Those of you who are in uh, the U.S. and are joining us here on uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Day holiday, we want to be respectful of uh, everyone's time and uh, and and uh, move through this. Uh, this is our first webinar here from Early Music America, Expanding Your Reach Through Early Music Month. Uh, the focus of this is, is in the title, but we're going to give you a couple of examples uh, of projects that happened back in 2018, last March, uh, that we thought were, were good examples of how to go beyond uh, just a concert hall performance or, or something else to sort of shake up the way you think about how you might engage your local community in a variety of ways, reach more diverse audiences through activities within Early Music Month. But of course, this can uh, apply throughout the year. We encourage focus here in our fourth annual Early Music Month uh, in March for people to use this as an opportunity to uh, think outside of the box but of course this can happen and we encourage it to happen uh, all the other months of the year. Uh, on the panel today, we have uh, two of our presenters from last year, Alice Cullen Ellison, who is with Bourbon Baroque in Louisville, Kentucky, and Steve Olson, who is the director of uh, the orchestra at, uh, at, and I lost it, the, in Great Falls, Montana, at the high school there. Remind me the name of the high school again, Steve. Charles M. Russell. Charles M. Russell High School. Uh, and Steve involved his students last year uh, in the orchestra. And so we're going to be hearing from them in a few minutes. Um, just in case you've never been part of one of these Zoom webinars before, there are a few features. We have a Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions throughout the, throughout the webinar, feel free to, to type those in there. And we're going to take uh, a time later in the webinar to address the, uh, the Q&A portion of that, but feel free to do that at any point. Uh, there is also an opportunity, and there's a chat window, uh, so if you have ways that you, uh, questions you wanna uh, ask, that's not exactly the best way. It's easier to go through the Q&A, but, uh, but you can pose uh, questions that way. And there's also, for those of you who are participants, there is a way of raising your hand. We're not gonna use the raise your hand uh, feature Right now, we're going to use the Q and A uh, so that we can uh, we can best answer your questions in a timely manner uh, toward the end. We're also going to talk a little bit about just some of the resources that are available through through uh, the Early Music Month website to help you get going as we're here about six weeks from from Early Music Month. Um, so I want to start uh, with with Alice. I, and just tell us a little bit about what you did with Bourbon Baroque in March of 2018 uh, and the projects that you came up with. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, so I'm one of the uh, one of two co-directors of Bourbon Baroque here in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, myself and John Austin Clark, who's a keyboard player. I'm a violinist. And just sort of a couple, three, four weeks before the month of March last year, I thought, oh my gosh, we don't have anything planned in March. We better do something. So um, it was a very last minute attempt at anything that we could arrange for the small amount of time that the two of us both had time for in, uh, in Louisville. Um, I was not even living in Louisville at the time, so I was coordinating it remotely. Um, it started out with uh, trying to perform in a space in Louisville where the uh, public transportation offices are. They have they're in a really beautiful old building that has a wonderful atrium that would be perfect for early music. Uh, and so, luckily, my mom lives here in Louisville and she happens to know the director of the public transportation and I contacted him but the atrium was going to be under construction so it wasn't possible for us to perform there. Uh, so we started trying to figure out other places to perform and we somehow, we, we tried to contact the VA hospital and they didn't really seem all that interested. Um, but then we 
we landed on, we, we finally got two places. Uh, one of them was the Portland Neighborhood Family Health Center, which is a health center for low income people from anywhere in, in Louisville can go there. There are several of these around town. Uh, and then the other place is the NIA Center in Louisville, which is a community center which provides all kinds of services. Um, it's out in the West End in Louisville. They have um, a driver's license and ID place. They provide career services and career counseling and um, all sorts of things like that. And we got in touch with these places sometimes just by Googling them and just reaching out to whatever email address they had there. Um, and these are certainly in areas where concerts like the ones that we generally put on would never happen. Uh, so we had to be persistent sometimes with contacting the people. They didn't always get back to us right away. But we ended up performing in those two places um, two days in a row. And we basically set up in the waiting room. So for the health center, we set up in the waiting room and the people waiting for their appointments, they just had to listen to us because we were performing there. Um, and I spoke a little bit about the music we were playing and Austin spoke too. So captive audience, it was great. Uh, but we did have comments after both of the concerts. People really did enjoy it. Um, at the health center, the, the, the staff there, they were really helpful and very excited about us coming. They actually uh, made a point to not make announcements over the PA system, and they made arrangements to actually go get people in the waiting room for their appointments so that we, didn't, they, we weren't interrupted by announcements. At the NIA center, it was a little bit different. Uh, we were sort of on our own there. Uh, we showed up, sort of set up in a little cafe waiting area where people were waiting to get IDs made. And we just played there and we did, there were people waiting and they did seem to enjoy it. And certainly most of these people had not heard this kind of music and maybe ever live classical music at all. Uh, one woman did at the health center, she came up and said she was maybe in her 60s or 70s. And she said she had not heard music like this in 50 years when she was in public school in Louisville and they took them to a school Louisville orchestra concert. So that was really wonderful to have someone who really appreciated and missed having it, you know, on all, all that time. Maybe she didn't realize she missed it, but when she heard it again, she was really moved by it. So it was very last minute. We planned it, like I said, two or three weeks out and it was being planned up until the day it happened. And then we just went and did it. And we, we maybe only had 45 minutes of music, um, an hour with talking and tuning, of course. Uh, but it was it was very fulfilling. It 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 was a wonderful experience. You're muted, Dave. When the unmute button doesn't unmute all, that's the great part. Uh, so thank you so much, and we'll come back and we'll hear a little bit more about uh, some of the some of the things that you you thought helped uh, get that going, Alice. Uh, Steve, if you would uh, talk a little bit about your project that you did with your students there in Montana. For sure. So much like Alice's project, ours was sort of in a way not really planned. Um, going into the new year last year, into 2018. We were picking out music for our March concert, which was originally going to be on a different date. And I had ended up picking out a couple of pieces of Baroque music, just not even thinking about doing an early music month concert. And all of a sudden I realized, oh yeah, we're going to be doing this in March. So why not actually have everybody do just an all Baroque concert? Um, and that sort of got the ball rolling with everything. I, you know, Baroque music is absolutely fantastic. I love Baroque music. It's such a unique style, especially because growing up in Montana and then going to college here and playing in our local Montana orchestras, you don't really get the opportunity to play a whole lot of Baroque music because it's not written for your traditional symphony orchestra, unless they, you know, reduce the orchestra and then have, have a lot of players sit out. It's usually just not that big of a deal. Um, so I decided years ago to start up a Baroque music um, ensemble here in Great Falls and that's just fired my love of Baroque music and being that I'm um, 
an orchestra teacher at one of the two high schools here in Great Falls, I thought this would be a really cool way to expose the kids to Baroque music, but it never really got off the ground because I think one of the biggest struggles with doing Baroque music, especially with high school students, the independence that each section has to have as far as rhythms go is absolutely atrocious. They can play the rhythms, especially if they move, you know, with a homophonic texture, it works great. But then all of a sudden, once it goes into the contrapuntal texture that many Baroque pieces have, it's, it's a huge challenge. Even though the rhythms might be very simple on their own, it's just hard for them to be really confident by a section. But last year we had a pretty solid orchestra throughout all uh, three groups. And I have four orchestras at CMR. There's two freshman groups, a middle group of sophomores through seniors, and then a top group of sophomores through seniors as well. And all of the groups together were quite strong. So I thought this might be really cool. So we put together a program. Each group essentially played two pieces. And I tried to give each group one piece that was a non-arrangement. So something that's original Baroque music and then another piece, if, it, if I couldn't find another original, just a, a really good arrangement of Baroque music for the kids. And in working on the pieces, we talked about, um, you know, just generic Baroque style things, longer notes, having space, um, trying to be more detached. So that way, 16th notes and faster passages can be heard through that. We talked about holding bows higher, even though we didn't actually play with Baroque instruments at all. Um, sometimes it's tough enough to to have the funding for our regular modern instruments for the orchestra. So we definitely didn't use period instruments, but I have a Baroque bow and let the kids try that to see you know, the difference of the weight and how to get around the instrument. Um, we talked about Baroque tuning and we played in Baroque tuning for a little bit, but it was just too difficult to get used to that new sound. You know, when you look at a page and you're so used to seeing a D sound like a D, and then suddenly it sounds like a C sharp, just the vibrations and how they relate to each other were just too difficult, but at least they got to try that. Um, and my high school actually has a harpsichord, which is kind of cool. It's not the greatest harpsichord, but it is a real harpsichord. So um, we worked that into the mix and we did the entire show without me as a traditional conductor. So I didn't use a baton or anything I sat and played harpsichord and the kids um, played without a traditional conductor which was pretty cool. And Steve can you talk a little bit about uh, the reception that you had from uh, you know the other the other music educators in your in your school your administration uh, the parents that kind of thing? Yeah um, everybody was really supportive of it they thought it was a really cool idea one of the things that I think is easy to fall into the trap of, especially when you're teaching, you know, whether it's middle school, elementary, or especially high school, is you go from concert to concert and it can kind of be like, oh, it's just another high school concert. It's kind of the same format. It's the same type of music. They're, they usually don't have themes to relate any of the music to each other. Kind of like modern symphony concerts, you want to try and change things up and have a theme, have things be connected, maybe have guest soloists. So last year I tried to make all of my concerts some type of different theme and the early music month really was a great theme to tie into. And so um, because they'd already had a couple themed concerts beforehand, they really enjoyed the Baroque concert. And I think a lot of the, the parents and the audience members that were there, at least from their comments afterward, it was it was kind of fun to hear them because they, they enjoyed hearing a different style of music that they usually don't get to hear, especially at school concerts. But I mean, even going to the symphony, you don't get to hear Baroque music, really. So it was really well received. The kids had fun working on it, too, because it was something totally new and different. And, you know, some of the kids in the end, they could hold their bows higher and they played that way. Some of the kids, it was a little difficult to get that new feeling. So they still held their bows the traditional way. Some of the cellos played their cellos without using their end pin and used their legs to support it. And so it was kind of like, here's how we sort of do it. If you can do it, try it. If you can't, that's okay. But at least, you know, you can play around with it. So it was a lot of fun. And Alice, uh, we have, we already have a, a question here and I think we can sort of move a little bit. We can, if there are other questions that are coming up, we can, uh, we can, we can sort of pepper those in now. Um, uh, one of our one of our attendees said, "What a great project, Alice! How did you make it work financially? Did you find funding for the concerts? Did you have a line item already in your budget for community engagement? 
Um, and did your mus do your musicians donate their services? Um, that's of course a super a good question. <laughs> uh, we Bourbon Broke is lucky. It's just the two of us, Austin and myself, and for our larger projects, we contract out and bring people in as most of the Midwest groups do. Um, for this, because I grew up here in Louisville and even though I wasn't living here at the time, I was coming home for these concerts. Um, we just did it ourselves. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't receive any money for it. We didn't have any funding for it. We printed, I made up a little flyer. I sort of have taught myself to use a little tiny bit of InDesign. Um, and I made up a flyer and we just made quick Facebook um, events with the flyer, pop-up concerts, you know, and we did have some people, the friends of, of mine um, come specifically for the concerts to these two locations that were quite out of the way, which was great. Um, but we didn't, we didn't have any funding. I have a big car, so we moved the harpsichord in the car. The two of us can move it by ourselves. We have someone to hold doors, you know, and uh, so really it's, it was no, it was just like the two of us getting together to play some music. We played rep that we've already played together. We had one rehearsal on it, you know, and, but because we played it together, it was rep we already played it was it was great it was fine and um we of course would have maybe liked to have been a little more prepared but it was all very last minute and people really enjoyed it cool. and i'll ask both of you uh what kind of resources and maybe we'll have steve respond first uh what kind of resources would you have liked to have had uh whether that's you know financial or in another form of support or what kind of resources do you think uh would have made that uh, that project maybe move to the next level if you would have uh, had them? Oh gosh, wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think it would be cool if we lived in a community that had maybe a specialty instrument store so kids could actually get the experience of trying that. It gives a whole new meaning to actual period music. Um, but I think really just getting it's it's always really a difficult challenge in Great Falls getting pub, the the public to come to your concerts, and it's whether it's getting more posters or getting more ads in the newspaper or things like that. It, it's it's very difficult, and you could spend a lot of money on advertising or not spend any money at all and get a ton of people or hardly get anybody. So, I think maybe you know we did what we could and we got a great audience, but just more help publicity wise, just getting the word out about coming to concerts and just seeing the importance of music, regardless of whatever it is in a community. And Alice? Um, I think for us, if somehow we'd had, you know, we knew, we knew several days in advance anyway, at least of what we were doing. And if we had someone who, was out in those communities already who could have gotten people at least let people know about the concerts um i think even if they didn't come that it would have felt like we had been able to make a bigger bigger effort to bring people to the spaces for something unusual maybe that they never had seen or heard before um, I don't know exactly what that would entail necessarily, but more, I guess, maybe more community leaders from those neighborhoods, um, letting them know to get the word out. Because, I mean, I, I don't know, I can't assume that everybody in Louisville is on Facebook is going to see, you know, our Facebook event. So, yeah, that, it would have been great to have been able to reach more people ahead of time, somehow. And we have a, uh, another question. Um, and honest, actually, this, this question I think would be good uh, put to the both of you. Do you see that there was an effect later on in terms of, uh, you know, in, enhanced uh, awareness of your organizations or better attendance or any sort of press coverage or anything like that from, uh, from the events that you did uh, back in, in March? 
Um, for us, I don't know necessarily if, you know, more people showed up to our later concerts. I sort of doubt that that was a result of it. Um, but it did stem another idea that I had um, that we did this past um, November um, with our Messiah. We have an organization called Hotel Louisville here that is um, long-term housing, uh, very cheap long-term housing for people, as well as part of a homeless shelter. And there are programs there, people live there for a temporary period of time. And so we ended up doing a dress rehearsal run through sort of at this place. And, and that idea sort of came to me in because of what we did in March, I was able to sort of think, oh, well, maybe we could do something in this other place. And we did make that happen. And we reached some people there as well who would not otherwise be able to attend concerts. So um, for us, that that's really important. And it's wonderful to be able to reach people who wouldn't otherwise be able to go. And Steve, what was what what do you see as the the impact that that your your project had um, following that since then? Um, I definitely noticed an increase of attendance at our concerts. Um, the way we've done concerts at um, CMR, typically um, the band is separate, the orchestra is separate, and the choir is separate. So we have all of our own concerts. And the, the orchestra's attendance, you know, just in the past, like especially when I started seven eight years ago, um, was very small, like very small, not even like parents would come to the concerts, they'd kind of just drop the kids off and say, I'll pick you up when it's over. And last year, especially with doing the two themed concerts beforehand, and then doing the early music show, I've noticed a huge change this year in the attendance. There's, there's more people there from the kids' families, and there's a lot more community members that are there. And people sending notes saying it was a great concert, you know, we need to have more things like this. It was just really fun and exciting to have something new. So it's, it's definitely been a really good thing. Uh, we have a question uh, that was directed toward us at EMA. Um, and uh, Matt's asking, is there anything that EMA does to support the March events listed in the calendar um, over other times of the year? And that's a really good question. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about Early Music Month uh, resources uh, here anyway. Um, so we have, if you've never visited the uh, earlymusicamerica.org events calendar, throughout all of the year, uh, those people who are mem organizations and individuals who are members of EMA can submit events to our events calendar. And then we share highlights of those in our weekly uh, e-notes newsletter that go out and uh, then it's accessible to anybody who wants to visit the website. Uh, but during the month of March, we put even more effort into that. So uh, those, those who are members have the ability to submit their own event the way they would normally do through their account menu, but also anyone else who is holding an early music event during the month of March can go to earlymusicmonth.org and submit that event, and we will then put it on the calendar for you. That allows, uh, that allows us to sort of show what's happening in early music throughout the month of March without that, uh, without that membership requirement. And then we do, uh, we do more focus on those. Uh, last year, we had almost 100 events that were submitted uh, to the account through the, through the month. Uh, and so we, we had a lot that was going on. Um, we like to share those through our social media so that people know what's coming up. Um, once again, we'll be highlighting those on uh, our newsletter throughout, throughout the month of March and as we get ready to move into March. Um, but we, we put a greater focus on this because the mission of Early Music Month is to raise awareness of the field of early music and not just uh, in one particular instance of that. We're not just talking about um, how to focus on uh, professional concerts, uh, and we're not just talking about how do we focus on workshops, but everywhere that early music is being engaged through different media, through different organizations and different communities, we want to highlight that. We want to highlight uh, amateurs who are performing. We want to highlight musicology. We want to highlight professionals, semi-professionals, uh, and and the the enthusiasts as well. In the past, we have taken time uh, 
uh, to talk about those uh, great supporters of early music who just sheerly by their uh, by their support uh, have have helped the field grow in it in itself. Um, and so part of that we see as uh, really giving the opportunity to focus on early music month events uh, is, is one of the greatest ways to do that during the month of March. We recognize that really for most of us, early music month is a, is a year long thing. We, we do this all the time, but uh, March gives us an opportunity to focus. Uh, and we, we think it's a, it's a pretty active time of year and it's a great opportunity for us to, to engage with the rest of the field and to, to pull everyone together. You can also become an Early Music Month partner at earlymusicmonth.org. Uh, that is 100% free. And all you're doing by becoming a partner is saying, I'm going to do something, whatever I can to raise the awareness. I Maybe it just means that I'm gonna let my friends know about my favorite recordings, or maybe it means I'm gonna put on a week long workshop. Uh, it could be whatever you want it to be. And it just, it just adds your name to that list. Right now that has uh, over 350 individuals and organizations who have signed on uh, to say that they're, they're supportive of the mission of Early Music Month. Um, and so we, we, are, we're, we and the other partners throw a lot of energy uh, into making sure that uh, this, this month comes off. Uh, there will be regular updates to our website, in, including the regular features and, and reviews, but we'll be doing even more at earlymusicamerica.org uh, to, to highlight during the month. We're working on a musical calendar with different musical highlights every day uh, that come from a variety of individuals who are both involved with EMA and um, are some of our membership uh, and lots of different ways just to keep the conversation going. And that's one of our, our, uh, our big goals is to keep the conversation at the forefront uh, as much as we can throughout the month of March. Uh, we had another question. Uh, this one uh, is is for Alice, uh, who says they used to live in Kentucky, uh, and they asked if the fund for the arts is supportive of uh, the efforts of of your uh, of your organization or or your activities there. Uh, we do receive, um, well, apply for, and every year so far have received the sort of standard grant that they give, and that. Um, that goes uh, into our sort of normal whole budget and we, we use that for our larger projects. So we do get funding from them. Um, if, we, if there had been something like the mini grants last year, you know, it, it would have just helped us uh, print nicer flyers or, you know, say, oh, we, we are using our time for this, like we could each get a little bit of money and use some extra for flyers or just spend it all on advertising, you know, <laughs> whatever it is that we, we could have used the money uh, if we'd had that sort of thing last year in any number of ways and it would have been really helpful. But I think we've obviously shown that it is absolutely possible to just uh, do it without any money and it, and it works. And it, I mean, we really spent time actually spent doing like physically moving to the locations and playing and getting everything moved home maybe six hours total between the two concerts you know it, it really was not a huge time commitment and it was something really fulfilling steve do you have advice for your fellow educators not just music educators but those who are regularly engaging with uh with students who may or may not have access to uh to early music yeah um one of the things that i found through doing the concert is it's if you like it do it if it's something that is passionate you know whether it's you are one of the early music enthusiasts and you just love early music like, why not have a whole lesson, you know, a week-long lesson or some unit during the month of March um, to teach your kids about early music? And that could be, you know, from, I don't know, it depends on the curriculum of your school, but like from the science teacher, even if they're totally like their jam is, you know, Telemann's Tafel music, 
great. I mean, you could, you could ex ex let your students explore that and maybe try and connect it scientifically so you can work it into your curriculum or have this cross curricular thing. But, you know, like from the, the music teaching standpoint, even if you're teaching like beginning string kids, you know, everybody, you know, as violinists and viola players, if you like out of the Suzuki books, you learn those three Bach minuets. I mean, you could have a whole, you know, presentation on those and the kids could explore those and learn them and maybe do a little mini presentation for your school's administration or the cafeteria ladies or you know something like that so it just gives the kids an opportunity to, to dig in and it also allows them to feel like they can participate in something like this and it's not just for you know the adults the professionals to do things like that um I think it would be really cool too for smaller schools that maybe don't have like a, a symphony or a musical ensemble as part of their community. But if they're cl fairly close to one, maybe, you know, hire in a group or if there's groups that do hire out, maybe consider contacting schools to come do an assembly or a cafeteria performance just to share that stuff with kids. You know, when I was in high school, I broke music. I, I really enjoyed it. But especially like period style playing, it was just, I, I didn't like it. It was not my thing. The way the strings sound, the whole weird nasally different tone quality that they those early instruments have just wasn't my thing. But then once I went to college and got really exposed to it, it was, it was like, that's, that's it. There's nothing better than that. So, you know, I think just getting the word out and really not being afraid to go forward with it. You know, I, a lot of the ideas that I have with my kids or even with my own musical ensembles here in Great Falls, I don't really have all the answers. I just say, I want to do this and then I'm going to figure out a way to make it happen. So, you know, if, if there are teachers out there or broke string playing professionals that maybe you have a studio or something and you're maybe interested in doing something, do it and see what happens, you know? That's really great advice. That's really great advice. And one of the things that I think uh, that we can we can offer, and we were going going back to uh, the events on the website, is you can still look if you go to our events calendar, uh, earlymusicamerica.org/events. You can still look back to last March and see what types of things were happening. Um, and we had workshops, and there were uh, there were informal sort of uh, instrument petting zoos, and uh, lots and lots of concerts. And I think learning from what other people have done, uh, similar to like what Alice and Steve have been speaking with us today about, um, are great ways of of figuring out. Uh, new and inventive ways of, of engaging different audiences. Um, later, later today, uh, we are actually going to be announcing the recipients of uh, our eight e uh, Early Music Month mini grants that we uh, had uh, individuals apply for. We had a great response to the application period for that, um, several dozen applications. And uh, once we make those announcements and we talk a little bit, we'll explain a little bit about what the projects that are being funded. Um, those are great examples uh, of how to think outside the box a little bit uh, for, for the music and how to engage individuals. And, and it can be done in a concert setting. It can be done outside of it. Uh, and those will be eight other uh, wonderful opportunities uh, to, to see what's going on and what people are doing uh, to, to speak about what we have, uh, 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 what we have to offer here in the field of early music. Uh, the, the website, someone asked again, uh, is earlymusicamerica.org. And then you can go to the events calendar from that. Uh, and it, it's right in the toolbar is the events calendar. And then you can search by the month and you can move yourself back to, back to March. Uh, and there are lots of ways you can sort that as well by your geographic location um, and uh, even somewhat by the types of events uh, and such. So at earlymusicamerica.org is where you, can, where you can find that. If you are uh, submitting an Early Music Month event, you can find that at earlymusicmonth.org. Uh, but you can also get to that from uh, the About Us part of earlymusicamerica.org. We are rounding out uh, the resources at earlymusicmonth.org. There are lots of resources for you. If you're, if you're sharing an event, we have Early Music Month logos uh, that you can put onto your publicity online, in paper. Uh, we have 
a, an example of a press release if you want to try to make uh, uh, send out a press release about early music month in general, about your activities in early music month, uh, making declarations for your town, maybe have the mayor declare it early music day or month or week. Uh, we've actually had that uh, happen in a couple of places um, and, and other resources just to help you uh, make those first couple of steps into, into uh, being involved with Early Music Month if you haven't done that before. Um, we've asked uh, members, uh, participants here the, uh, to, if you would, uh, if you want to, you can share your location in the chat menu. We're trying to see uh, just where everybody's coming from. Uh, particularly, we've already had uh, from uh, Nova Scotia, the Bay Area, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, and so if you want to share where you're from, uh, we'd love to see where people are joining us from. Uh, we have another comment here uh, from one of the attendees uh, who says they're part of a regular practice challenge for reporter players and other early music folks. A practice challenge with a chat group or a blog would be a simple and productive way of producing in early music month. That's a great example. Uh, it, it's just uh, a time when it's already a, sort of a loosely based activity and you're just inviting people to engage with that. Uh, that's, that's a wonderful, thank you for that, that contribution there. If we have other, other questions, we have a, a, a few more minutes here that we could, we could take to answer questions. I think we've... If we're waiting for questions, I can yes. say, um... Once again, uh, we've been late in the planning for this year's Early Music Month. Um, but uh, so far, I'm starting to organize two last minute events uh, for us to do again, just Austin and I, same deal. Um, one of them is at an art gallery here in Louisville for one of our trolley hop nights that we have the first Friday of every month. Um, I know someone who owns a gallery, so I contacted them and I feel like you don't even have to know someone who owns a gallery to do this. I, many gallery owners and curators, they want music whenever there's open open house. Um, and she, absolutely, we'd love to have you. So we're gonna play for a few hours. Um, that happens to be March 1st. So that's gonna be a great kickoff for us. And then we're also gonna do, um, still in the works, but hopefully we're gonna do a, 45 minute to an hour lunchtime concert at um, a new place in town, the African American Heritage Museum. And just a, a little bit of research um, online using, you know, Grove and uh, IMSLP, our usual resources. Uh, you know, I found um, Chevalier de Saint Georges and Ignatius Sancho, both. Um, Black composers from the late 18th century, um, one in France and one in England. And so we're putting together some music for that for just this short lunchtime concert. Hopefully that's going to happen. Um, and, you know, this is just being planned right now. It's just about reaching out to anybody you can, as many people as you can. And maybe you'll get, say, you reach out to 10 people, maybe you'll get one response. But even if you just do that one thing, I think it makes a big difference. And the more that ensembles do this or people, anybody does this kind of thing in their city, over time, you just sort of get more exposure, your name gets out more, people talk about you. And even if more people don't come to your concerts, you know, like you've, you've reached some people who are fulfilled in some way, so. And Steve, do you have any, any uh, plans this month for uh, early music month? Um, at this point, there's nothing official yet. It would be, I've been kind of toying around with the idea of doing like some broke chamber music with the kids. We do have, you know, our, our March concert already planned. So that's kind of full, but it would be kind of cool for just, even if there's just like five or six kids that want to play, um, just read some easy trio sonatas, do a couple of rehearsals and put some stuff together. Um, we also do have like some first Friday type events here that like Alice was mentioning and that gives me a good idea that could be a place to reach out and and just go play um, or like art museum stuff like that and say and you know that's one of the things that just even doing this webinar that's just great I mean people just are there to help and I think you know if 
anybody else like for early music month needs help with anything just reach out to any of our members i mean it's early music america is a fantastic organization so and uh we have we do have a member directory that's on at earlymusicamerica.org and you can look through the through the directory that's under the membership part of the toolbar and you can actually sort that by by location so maybe you can find someone in your area uh who 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 can share the load uh, or might have a have a new idea uh, you can even search by the types of instruments that people have said that they're playing uh, and if you are a member of early music america uh, you can update your your profile information so that uh, it's easier for others to know the types of projects that you might be willing uh, and available to participate with or the types of things that you enjoy uh, and uh, uh, those uh, those other ways of connecting uh, with each other. Um, and we're not seeing any other questions. And uh, so I think uh, I'll say thank you both to, oh, we have, we do have a question, late, late breaking question here. Um, and this, uh, person says, in the interest of bringing awareness to early music as an entire community, uh, people can go not just to your own ensemble. Is there a good way to refer to EMA at during early music month outreach event and send people to earlymusicamerica.org? Uh, uh, I think the easiest way to refer people to us is to send them to earlymusicamerica.org. Um, there they can find information about becoming a member uh, about member benefits, but they can also find out a lot about early music by visiting our website through a lot of the resources that we have that are not just um, that are not just based uh, on on membership or based around the field. Uh, and under the resources section, that that covers uh, scholarships and grants and a list of higher education uh, institutions that offer early music. Uh, we have an early music uh, instrument exchange. Uh, and other opportunities. And so sending individuals to earlymusicamerica.org uh, is probably the, the best way to, to do that. Um, earlymusicmonth.org will also get them to earlymusicamerica.org. And I think that's uh, one of the easiest uh, is just to take them to the, to the website. We also have a, a pretty loyal following on our Facebook page. Uh, and so you can find us on Facebook at Early Music America. Um, we have another uh, comment here uh, from a participant who says they're reaching out to area high school string orchestras working with their directors to determine a baroque work that they are already preparing and arrange a short performance and coaching with them uh, and then providing those students with tickets to uh, this other uh, individual's upcoming event so using a an, an education opportunity is also an outreach uh, to to bring uh, uh, students to see their first live performances or uh, additional performances. Um, we also had a comment here uh, in the interest of bringing awareness to early music as an entire community. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, uh, I already answered that one. <laughs> it popped up a second time. So we've already answered that, that question. But uh, using early music month activities as an extension of what you're already doing is something that many, many of our participants uh, have taken advantage of and saying, we're, we're doing this activity during early music month. And because it's early music month, we wanna, we wanna say what that means. And so we're gonna add one little thing to it, one small thing to extend that, maybe offer uh, an opportunity to have people come to a dress rehearsal or uh, just the, uh, the opportunity to uh, get in touch with those instruments in a, in a personal way um, or opening up uh, a regularly closed playing the session to, to others with different instruments, with modern instruments. Um, and so there are a lot of people who are, who are just trying to see what other step they can take to enhance the awareness of early music through their, through their activities there. Okay, well, I think we have, we have uh, we've answered all the questions that we've had posed for now. We will be archiving this uh, webinar on our website at earlymusicmonth.org. We'll put that in the resources section of earlymusicmonth.org. Um, and once again, I do want to thank Alice Cullen Ellison and Stephen, uh, Steve Olson for joining us and being our panels, uh, panelists today. And 
for uh, for their support of early music and for for helping us. So thank you, Alice and Steve. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, as always, if anyone has questions, you can send, uh, you can contact us through the Early Music America website. You can also sign up at the homepage, earlymusicamerica.org for our contact list. So you'll get our weekly e-notes, which includes not only featured articles from EMA, but also information about what's going on in North America, in the community, through events, through uh, other curated articles that we have found that have come out uh, week to week. Uh, and you can sign up by just uh, putting your email address in the field at the bottom of our website uh, and, and then continuing from there. Um, so we will, we will quickly get this up on the website. So anybody wants to share that, if you haven't become a partner, go to earlymusicmonth.org and become a partner today. It's free, submit your events and we're looking forward to supporting everybody as we uh, move into our fourth annual Early Music Month here in 2019. Uh, I'm David Wood. I'm the Marketing and Special Projects Coordinator for Early Music America, and I just want to thank everybody for joining us today.